I'm quite pleased to see you, and I'm quite pleased to be speaking on this topic, uh, which is HALT, who goes there? I want to talk about redefining authentication technologies for the 21st century. Now, th this expression, HALT, who goes there, is frequently heard in English, but perhaps in the context of a movie. Uh, we think of this perhaps as someone approaching a castle or approaching a walled city, and there will be a guard there that will say, HALT, who goes there, asking the person to present some form of credential to show that they're authorized to be in this area. And so this is exactly what I want to talk about today. I started thinking about the concept of walled cities and did just a little bit of historic research to find that the first walled city, or perhaps walled proto-city, was Jericho, and that was close to 10,000 years ago. Um, archaeological digging in the 1950s revealed a couple other walled cities, also both here in the Middle East, Kote Diji and Uruk. Kote Diji is in Pakistan and Uruk is in Iraq. Both of these cities had walls, possibly for the purpose originally to protect against flooding, but ultimately, of course, walls around a city are used to protect the city from invasion by people from outside the city, keeping city dwellers in and keeping non-city dwellers out. Um, so walls can be used as access control, walls can be used as flood control, and it occurs to me there's two types of access control. You want to make sure when I want to access a room that I have the necessary authorizations to access the room, but you also want to make sure that I have not had authorizations revoked. This sounds like the same problem, but it's really two different problems, and let me explain what I mean. When I came into the airport on Sunday, I had to present my passport to show that I was a U.S. citizen, and U.S. citizens are offered visas on site. I don't know how long the visa is valid for, maybe three months. Uh, the visa was valid for the time necessary to come to this particular meeting. And so the customs officer looked at the visa he determined that it was an authentic U.S. visa, that it had not expired, and by looking at the photo and the biographical details, he could connect it with me to determine that I had the authorization to come to the United Arab Emirates. But then he did a second thing, and that is he checked databases to make sure that I have not been unauthorized to come to the UAE. The most common reason for loss of authorization, say, is by overstaying previous visas. And so these are really two different processes. You want to determine that I'm authorized to come into the country, but you also want to determine that I have not been unauthorized, and that's two completely different processes involved in determining my authorizations. So um, what we have said historically when someone comes into an area is that you must halt to have your authorizations authenticated, and we're still doing that at the airports here in the UAE, we're still doing that at the airports in the United States. We're asking passengers to halt such that their authorizations could be authenticated. I started thinking about this issue of walls around cities and what it would take to put up a wall around a city if we had to analyze that in today's terms. The first thing that occurred to me is that you cannot have a phased introduction of a wall around a city. You can't say, well, let's build 100 meters and see how that works. And then if we like the first 100 meters, we'll build another 100 meters. With a wall around a city, you either have to have the whole wall or no wall at all. It doesn't pay you to do a phased introduction. And then there are some critical design issues. You have to ask, well, how tall should our wall be? How thick should our wall be? And, and what about gates? Where should we place the gates? How many gates should we have? Uh, and then what about towers? We may want to look over the wall to determine what's happening on the other side. We may want to put up some towers, but we're not done then. Even when we've understood the technology and what we want this thing to look like, we have to ask what our policies and procedures are going to be. For instance, who can come into the city and who can go out from the city? And who will authorize entrances and who will authorize exits? And how will those authorizations be authenticated and who will do the authentication? And then who's going to pay for all this? Who is going to pay for these guards? Now the point I'm trying to make is that when we put a wall around the city, the wall is the technology, but it's not the solution. 
The solution involves not only the technology and the design of the technology to meet the problems, but it requires all the policies and procedures necessary to turn the technology into a solution that solves a known problem. And so when we say halt, who goes there, that's the procedural part of a solution that's necessitated by this particular technology. Hmm. Well, before we go any farther, I think I should stop and define some terms. Uh, often when we start talking about authentication and authorization and identification, uh, we get uh, mixed up because we're not really clear as to what we mean when we use these words. I'm going to rely here on a report from the U.S. National Academies of Science that was done in 2003 called Who Goes There? Authentication Technologies Through the Lens of Privacy. And in that report, uh, three definitions were given that we'll use here. The first is authorization. And that is what a person is allowed to do. I'm authorized to be in this hall today. I'm authorized to be up on this stage. Authentication is to prove the truth of the claim. So if I want to prove to you that I am indeed authorized to be on the stage, I will show you my badge here and it says speaker on it. And so this is the authorization uh, uh, the way that you authenticate my authorization to be up here on the stage. Now, identification is something quite different. Identification is connecting someone or something to a record of attributes. Now, uh, uh, this is really interesting. We sometimes think about, colloquially, identification in terms of who am I. But for the case of, of technical authorizations and authentications, as we're talking about now, who am I is a philosophical or religious question that we don't have to answer. What you're really interested in when we're talking about who I am for these purposes is what attributes can be given to me. Uh, I'm a U.S. citizen, I speak English, I'm in my mid-60s, uh, I'm interested in the field of biometrics and authentication. Those are the things that you really need to know, and my identity then becomes those list of attributes that you find important. Now, clearly, I have a different set of attributes to my friends in California. I have a different set of attributes to my children than I have for you here today. You're interested in the identity that applies to what I am doing here today, and identification from that point of view is nothing more than linking me to a set of attributes. Oh yes, he's the English-speaking American male that we heard at the Cards and Payments seminar speaking about the issue of authentication. Now, if we adopt these definitions, then we can see immediately that authentication of authorizations does not necessitate identification. You don't have to know a complete list of attributes of me to know that I am authenticated as authorized to be up here on the stage. I, I have this badge around my neck. Now you can say this is not very solid authentication. I may have found this or I may have stolen it from someone. So you may want to add additional layers of authentication, for instance, a facial image on this badge so that you can be even more certain that the badge, in fact, was issued to me. But you don't need to know my name. You don't need to know anything more about me than that. And that brings up the possibility of anon anonymous authentication. And we'll talk about that here in a slide or two when we talk about a Disney World application where I can be authenticated without a name. Now, my name appears on the badge, and I'm glad it does. If you see me out in the hall and you can't quite remember who I am, you look at the badge and you say, oh, yes, James, and you can address me as James, and that makes a, a nice, friendly uh, bit of conversation we could have. But it's not absolutely necessary that you apply a name to me to check to see that I'm authorized, in fact, to be in the hall or on the stage. So the possibilities of anonymous authentication of authorizations is also a very interesting one that we can spend some time thinking about. Well, I want to talk about three different situations here that would require different forms of authentication of authorizations. Uh, let's talk first about banking and ATM, automated teller machines. Now, I have an ATM card here in my wallet, and 
I am not going to lose that card if I can help it. I'm not going to loan or give away that card to anyone. Why? Because it's my money and my credit that's at risk. To use that ATM card, I have to have a PIN number, but I guarantee you I'm very protective of that PIN number. And I'm not going to give you my card, and I'm not going to give you the PIN number. Why? Because I stand to lose something if my credentials are taken and used by someone else. So I'm very protective of this. Um, if I do, in fact, lose my uh, ATM card, which happened to me fairly recently, I immediately called the bank, I notified them, and they turned off the authorizations on the ATM card. I didn't lose any money. And so it makes sense that authorization for use of the ATM card can be authenticated simply through a PIN. Why? Because I protect both the PIN and the ATM card very, very closely, because it's my assets at risk. Now, I want to contrast that with the situation of Disney World, which is an amusement park in Florida. When Disney World issues me a season pass, it is Disney World revenue that's at risk if I should give that pass away. Now, I don't happen to have a Disney World season pass, but if I had such a season pass and you wanted to borrow it from me, I would be happy to lend you that season pass. Why? I have no assets at risk. It is Disney that loses the revenue because I've lent you the season pass, correctly? So consequently, I am tempted to give away my authorization credentials to you. And if a PIN or a password was required to activate those authorization credentials, I would also give the PIN and the password to you. Or I might sell the season pass, which incidentally is illegal according to Florida state law. And so consequently, Disney has no trust that I will protect this asset of theirs. And consequently, Disney for the last 20 years now has protected season passes through the use of biometrics. From about 1996 to about 2004, they used finger geometry. And finger geometry is just a shadow of these two fingers. And then about 2004 or 2006, Disney switched to a system using fingerprinting. And so now when you're issued a season pass at Disney World, the first time you use it, you place your thumb down on a fingerprint scanner. That connects your fingerprint with that season pass. And then when you attempt to use the season pass in the future, it's compared against the fingerprint on the pass. And that prevents you from giving away or loaning your Disney season passes to other people. Now, the, the Disney system is very sophisticated, and I might add that if you buy passes for your family, all of your family passes and fingerprints are linked, meaning if you and your spouse exchange tickets, no problem. The system is smart enough to know that those tickets link to a series of fingerprints and will check all of the fingerprints. And in the event that your fingerprint is not recognized, because fingerprints do change, and fingerprints are fairly easily damaged. These friction ridges on the end of your fingers change from day to day and are damaged from day to day. Then a guest relations officer will come over and will apologize and will ask a few simple questions just to verify that you haven't borrowed someone's season pass or bought a season pass illegally on the black market. So in the case of ATM machines and my ATM card, a PIN and a password works just fine. But for protecting Disney assets using a season pass, a PIN or a password wouldn't work at all. And so Disney has gone to biometrics. Now, what do we see in the case of passports? In the case of passports, it's national security that's at risk. Passports are sold, they are lent, and they are lost. And so consequently, the government cannot have any trust that the person that's walking through immigration is in fact carrying their own passport. And so the way things currently worked for me as I came in here to the UAE is that my facial image on the passport was compared to my facial image as I approached the counter and the biographical information on the passport further convinced the immigration officer that I was the correct holder of the passport. Now I've been working with a number of countries, most specifically Australia, and Australia has an automated system now where the facial image on the passport will be compared automatically to the facial image taken of me at the gate as I enter into Australia, such that I never have to speak to a 
customs officer. But what's important to note is that in any of these applications, it's still necessary for me to halt, to stop at a gate, and to have my authorizations authenticated. And that's the point I want to make now in the rest of this talk today. There have been some breakthroughs in the area of biometric authentication over the last 18 months or two years. Um, I worked on a U.S. government project about 18 months ago where we actually tested uh, two of the prototypes of the systems you're going to see here. So I'm going to show you a video that I put together of three different systems that allow for biometric authentication of authorizations without the halt part of the equation that allow people to be recognized by fingerprint, by iris, or by face while on the move. So let's see if I can get this video to play here. And it takes about two minutes to get through it. And I hope by pushing that, we can start the video. Uh, it worked. Now the first, there's no sound here. I am the sound. The first uh, device you're going to see is a new device by Morpho, which is a French company. It's a device for collecting fingerprints in a contactless way. Your hand does not touch that device. You'll see in the next series of photographs people walking through and simply swiping their hand over this scanner without touching it at all, and their fingerprints are recognized and their authorizations are authenticated. This next video is from Sarnoff Corporation, and it's iris on the move. It's recognizing the iris patterns of people as they come through a portal. So here are people walking through a portal. The systems are, is looking at their iris and is looking at the patterns of their iris and comparing the patterns of the iris to the iris patterns of people that are authorized access. And here you can see an exception being handled. This person was not recognized, and so now there's an officer here that's going to ask a few more questions and to take care of the situation as required. The final video is by NEC and shows authentication of authorizations through the use of facial recognition software. And these people are being recognized, and I, I, I want you to note here at the end when that little red number turns to four, they'll show a notification here over a cell phone. I want to come to, back to that in a minute. Now, I want to be very careful about what you have seen and the way I describe it. Everything you've seen here is absolutely correct. It happens that way. I have tested these products on behalf of the U.S. government. But the devil is in the details, as we say. And let me take those three systems on one by one. The first system you saw, the fingerprint recognition system, everyone was able to fully open and extend their hand. The pace at which the hands went over the scanner did not exceed the refresh rate of the computer technology, correct? And thirdly, there was no provision made for exception handling. What if one of these people was not recognized? In that video, you saw no provision at all for pulling those people out of line and resolving the issue. In the second video you saw, and again, the system works exactly as you saw it, everyone was looking straight ahead, no one was wearing cosmetic pattern contact lenses, and there wasn't any case where a very short person was um, obstructed by two tall people on either side. And lastly, in the facial recognition method that you saw, you noted that the camera was absolutely at eye level. I cannot tell you the number of failed facial recognition systems I've seen because someone thought it would be a good idea to place the camera either high on the wall or even in the ceiling. Trust me, you cannot recognize my frontal face from the picture of the top of my head. So what I'm suggesting to you is what you've seen is the demonstration of the technologies. You've not seen a solution. The solution is going to require policies and procedures to be put into place to meet a particular business need, none of which 
was illustrated here in these videos, although these videos were factually very, very correct. Now, the next thing I want to talk about here in the last couple of slides is the role for mobile biometrics. In that last video from NEC, you saw how notifications were coming to a cell phone. And in fact, um, I've been working with a couple of governments in the area of, of immigration crossing where they intend to do exactly that. They intend to have immigration officers circulating in the immigration hall, and those <coughs> excuse me, officers will get notifications on their cell phone of interesting um, uh, occurrences uh, in, in the hall uh, through the biometric system. But in addition to that, I want to talk very briefly and show you one more video about biometric technologies that exist on the cell phones. I think you're all acquainted uh, with the iPhone 5 or the iPhone 6 that has a built-in fingerprint scanner to this, to the device. Uh, but there are a number of other biometric systems that are now available on cell phones that lend the possibility of selfies Biometric selfies, meaning I collect my own biometric, and not only that, I store and I protect my biometric characteristics on my own cell phone. This is a very, very different paradigm than previously what we saw, where the system owner, perhaps Disney World, for instance, is the one that collects and maintains my fingerprints. Now we've got a situation where I collect and I maintain my fingerprints, and I'm responsible for the security of those fingerprints. So let me show you one more video here that combines videos from three different companies. The first video is going to show us eye recognition, not iris recognition, but recognition of people by the vein patterns in their eyes using a mobile device. This requires no special hardware. The software is immediately downloadable. Uh, what's being used, of course, is the camera in the mobile device. Now, you should all be acquainted with the iPhone instantiation of fingerprints. This, of course, requires a specialized fingerprint reader that sits inside the iPhones. But again, <coughs> you collect your own fingerprint in the iPhone, and that fingerprint never leaves your control as long as you are holding on to your own iPhone. And now one last video of a company that's recently come out with a product that also takes fingerprints but uses the camera in the smartphone for recording the fingerprints. No extra hardware in the phone is needed at all. All right, so what we've seen is a bunch of videos of technologies, not solutions, right? I mean, these are just technologies. They don't solve any business problem at all. And I'm not even sure what the potentials are here because I'm not smart enough to have thought through all the possible solutions that could come from these technologies. But I can give you an idea of what's going to have to happen if we are going to take these technologies and turn them into solutions. The first thing that has to happen is you need to understand your problem. What problem are you trying to solve? Now, I, I received a phone call maybe a month or two ago by a person that was representing a large professional association, 
And he called me up and he said, Jim, I'm real interested in uh, biometric technology. Can you tell me about that? And I said, certainly. What problem do you want to solve? And he said, well, we really haven't thought about that. If you want to use biometrics as a solution, or any of these authentication technologies as a solution, you must first have a good idea of what your problem is. And then you have to select the correct technology for the problem, and then you have to put policies and procedures into place to make the technology work in your environment. Human factors are going to be huge. It's one thing to say that people can walk by and put their hands through a scanner, but can people walk by and put their hands in a scanner in a nice orderly fashion so that the rate of the hands going through the scanner does not exceed the recycling time of the software, for instance? And then what happens to people who are not recognized? How do you ask people to take out their pattern contact lenses, or what alternate solutions do you come up with for people that want to wear pattern contact lenses, for instance. Um, then, of course, you need a business case to justify the cost of putting the system into place. I could go on and on telling you stories about government applications that, that did not adequately assess the business case before rushing to a biometric technology, spending far more on the technology than the savings incurred. So you've got to think through the business case as well, and then, of course, stakeholder acceptance. And when I say stakeholder acceptance, I'm not only talking about the data subjects, I'm talking about the owners of the property onto which you're going to put the biometric device. For example, I talked to you about uh, working with immigration in Australia. The Australian immigration people put their smart gate biometric recognition system into an airport. The airports are owned in Australia by private companies. So you have to get the airport authority to agree to give up the property necessary to allow you to put up the biometric recognition device. You also have to get the travelers to use these devices because use of the device is absolutely optional. And so stakeholder buy-in and change management is one issue that's very rarely considered adequately when we go to the, move to these technologies. And then I want to add, perhaps most importantly, that you don't want to buy a technology from a vendor, but rather you want to set up a relationship with both a technology vendor and a system integrator to take your problem, take a technology, and then provide a solution. I can't, esti uh, I, I can't emphasize how important it is uh, that when you visit these booths here, uh, in the hall, you think in terms of developing relationships as opposed to simply purchasing a technology. I could tell you horror story after horror story of where particularly governments thought they could simply purchase technologies off the shelf and have it immediately be a solution to a problem that they really fully didn't understand. We don't want to be buying a technology, we want to be entering in a relationship with someone that will help us to craft a solution. And lastly, I would add that operational audits are always important. How well is our system performing once we have it installed? And how can the system be made to perform better through maybe fairly simple tweaks in how we use it? So I want to leave you with that idea today, is that what we're talking about here are technologies, but converting the technology into a solution to a, really bu a real business problem is what your job is. The vendors out there can't give you a solution to your problem. I cannot give you a solution to your problem. But we can talk about technologies that, with your help and your brain power, could become solutions to your problems. And so my final slide is that after thousands, literally thousands of years of authenticating technologies by asking people to halt, stopping is no longer a requirement. We now have technologies that hold the possibility of being placed in solutions which allow people just to keep moving as we say to them, welcome, we recognize your authorizations. So my question to you is, how will you create solutions from these technologies? Thank you.